Good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> As a member of the Southwestern College Board of Trustees, it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you here today. We have so been looking forward to the 2024 Docking Lectures on Leadership and Public Affairs presented by Dr. Juliette Garcia. The Docking Lectures are underwritten by William Docking of Arkansas City, the late Thomas Docking of Wichita, and the Union State Bank. The Docking family has played a prominent role in Kansas government and politics for over half a century. Actually, I grew up living across the street from the Dockings in our Kansas City. And uh, as a child, I knew they, was, they were associated with significance and celebrity. But to me, they were just wonderful neighbors, and the two sons were great playmates. As I grew up, though, I realized that the family's dedication to service and generous community support was something that served as an inspiration and a model for how I wanted to live in uh, attending to the greater good. In 1956, Georgia Docking was elected governor of Kansas. He served two terms, leaving office in 1961. His son, Robert Docking, was elected governor in 1966 and served four terms more than any other Kansas governor leaving office in 1975. Robert Docking's sons have continued the family's commitment to public service. William Docking was appointed to the Kansas Board of Regents in 1995 and served as its chair. Thomas Docking was lieutenant governor from 1983 to 1987 during the governorship of John Carlin. His wife, Jill Docking, a businesswoman in her own right, ran for the U.S. Senate in 1996 and for lieutenant governor in 2014. She also served as a four-year term on the Kansas Board of Regents. The Dockings are public servants who represent us well, and we at Southwestern College are so grateful for their friendship and support. On behalf of Southwestern College, I share our sincere gratitude to the Docking family and Union State Bank for the continued support of this important lecture series and the opportunity for learning that it affords our community. Today we are also grateful to Dr. James Sears Bryant and his wife Anne, who helped to create our connection with Dr. Garcia and have generously supported, generously supported Dr. Garcia's visit. Dr. Sears Bryant is a great friend of Southwestern College, working in partnership with his good friend, Dr. Don Pless, to make exciting things happen on our campus. To the Bryants, we also extend our utmost gratitude. As you can see, there were many hands and contributions that made this day possible for our college, so please join me in thanking everyone involved. Indeed, today is a historic day at Southwestern College as we welcome Dr. Juliet Garcia, who throughout her career has exemplified courageous leadership and dedication to building community. With that in mind, we are going to begin the 2024 Docking Lecture Series, unlike we ever have, by honoring Dr. Garcia with the conferral of an honorary degree. I was honored when I was asked to introduce Dr. Garcia, who today will receive an honorary degree in Humane Letters. But I have to tell you, in just talking to her for a few minutes and discussing uh, this morning with uh, our president, Dr. Liz, I found that she really isn't only about these wonderful accomplishments you're about to hear, but she is truly an authentic leader, and I think that will come across right away. The first doc honorary degree that was ever given was given by Oxford in 1498. The selection process differs at every school, but at Southwestern College, we select recipients based upon their professional, social, and personal accomplishments. 
We choose individuals who are deserving of institutional honor, who we believe to truly be builders in and of the world. As we reflected upon the important work of Dr. Garcia, a person we hold in, esteem, in esteemed regard, there was much agreement that it was appropriate to honor her as a builder while she is with us on campus. Named the first Latina to serve as president of a college or university in the United States in 1986, Dr. Garcia spearheaded the creation of the University of Texas at Brownsville and then served as its president, president for 22 years, graduating over 40,000 students and leading the design and establishment of the Brownsville campus. In 2011, she helped lead an effort to envision a new 21st century university model that eventually consolidated two UT universities, established a medical school, and created the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Her life's work has been focused on expanding higher education opportunities for the people of the Rio Grande Valley, advancing her own community, her home. In Washington, D.C., she has served on the Clinton and Obama presidential transition teams, chaired the advisory committee to Congress on financial aid, and in 2021, served on the panel to select the White House Fellows under President Biden. After the election of President Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid, she was selected to work in South Africa to help integrate higher education there. She has served on the boards of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and also the Ford Foundation. In 2009, Time Magazine named her one of the top 10 college presidents in the United States. And in 2014, she was recognized by Fortune Magazine as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. She currently serves on the board for the Lozano, Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies at UT Austin, Audubon, Texas and Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. Annually, she lectures at Harvard's Graduate School of Education IEM program for professionals seeking to become university presidents, and with HACU, Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities Leadership Academy. She is currently working with Texas 2036 a group of Texans studying how best to shape the future in Texas across seven core state policy areas. On campus, she teaches public speaking to students in the Math and Science Academy, and she teaches courses in organizational communication and Latinas in leadership, focusing on the key communication skills needed for the next generation leaders. On July 7th of 20, 2022, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Joe R. Biden for transforming her hometown University of Texas Brownsville into a center of excellence for countless students who were inspired by her example. A trailblazer and a mentor, Dr. Garcia is considered one of our nation's top university administrators who understands the power of education as the great equalizer in America. At this time, President Fromgen, please bring our candidate forward for the presentation of the degree. Dr. Garcia, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees and by their action, I confer upon you, Juliet V. Garcia, the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, with all rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto pertaining.
there she is. Buenos dias. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. It's a great honor. Es un gran placer estar aquí con ustedes ahora en la, uh, este día, un día tan bonito en el estado que no conocía hasta ayer. It is a real pleasure to be here with you in your beautiful city and your, see your beautiful college. I have never been in Kansas except in Wizard of Oz, you know, and so it was wonderful to, to be invited here. It is, it is a great honor to be on a college campus. It is, it is the lifeblood of this democracy. I remember when I was a baby president, and I was a baby president. I had wonderful black hair. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but way in the recesses of your mind. Um, I went to go in, and study other presidents. Because as a student, that's what you do, right? When you want to know how to how to do something better, you just study a little bit harder or read one more book or interview someone. So I looked for the best presidents I could find in the nation. And I went to go and visit them to try and understand what is the most important part of your job. And so I found one in Miami. His name was Bob McCabe. He was a president of Miami-Dade Community College. And at that time, Miami-Dade had over 50,000 students. Today it has, I don't know, probably 200,000 students. And I said, President McCabe, what is the most important part of your job as president? And he said, to sustain the democracy of the United States. And I had heard many answers, but they had been about building endowments and increasing the campus facilities and working on scholarships and finding the smartest faculty you could. I had never heard, though, the words of to sustain the democracy of the United States. And I said, sir, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. And he said, if I do my job really well, I will invite into higher education the next generation of Floridians, native Floridians, of people from Cuba, from Haiti, wherever they come from, to our door. I'll engage them, I'll help them become successful, in, uh, members of this community, of our campus, and then of their nation. Then they will become the voters and the citizens of our nation in the future. They are the ones that will, will vote and volunteer and will build the next generation of uh, needed for our democracy. In other words, they will um, help build our democracy, they will protect our democracy, and they will sustain our democracy. So my job is to build the next generation to sustain our democracy. I closed my little notebook up, went back to Brownsville, and I decided if he can believe that where he is, where we are is in the southernmost tip of the state of Texas with a border and with all of Central and Latin America beneath us, then I will do the same. I will try to do the same for me. So sometimes you pick up your mission from those smarter, wiser than you are and who might have tread that ground before us. I am honored to be standing here then um, today to tell you that that mission uh, was possible for us. And I want to thank you, not only you know, to thank you for the accolades for today, thank you for the privilege of being on your campus and for meeting some of the folks that are so important to you, but also for helping me do this important work, sustaining the democracy of our precious United States. Thank you. Thank you again. So I think it goes without saying that you know why we invited her now. So can we, I'm going to go off script, Katie, just a little bit for a moment. Can we just welcome her in the best builder in Kansas fashion to Kansas? So as we've heard throughout her incredible career, Dr. Garcia has held pivotal roles in higher education, serving as a spark for transformational change. Her unwavering dedication to student success, can you feel that, students? And academic advancement has earned her widespread acclaim and admiration from peers 
and colleagues alike, including so many of us on this campus. With a strong commitment to excellence and innovation, Dr. Garcia has boldly propelled organizations and institutions forward, fostering environments of learning, inclusivity, and progress. Today, I'm excited, and it's a little different, because I think you know we're a little different, to host a fireside chat as opposed to kind of a straight sort of lecture, because I thought our community would appreciate that. As you know, I encourage us as a campus and community to think and act boldly, and we're doing it. And I know that Dr. Garcia's work is a great example of bold leadership, strategic thinking, and hard work. So, Dr. Garcia, will you join me on the chairs to our left? Before we begin, I want to induct her formally into the Builder family, and I think you can't really see it, but most of you probably have a sense of what this is. <coughs> Dr. Garcia, our athletic mascot is a little black cat. <laughs> we have a real one in our field house. He lives there. He owns the place. I heard. But um, <laughs> as, as entering into our community, we often give jinx pins, and so welcome to the family. Thank you. I appreciate it. Wear it with pride. I will. Awesome. I so, don't want to put it on upside down. There you go. Perfect. properly pinned. It looks perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the family. Thank you. <laughs> so I have a series of sort of topics for us to think about, um, but the, the first question that I would ask you is Susan Andrews, one of our trustees, did a wonderful introduction of you and all your accolades and accomplishments, <clears throat> which are themselves simply fantastic. What did we miss in the introduction that you would want our community to know? What did we not include? Uh, the times it didn't work, <laughs> right? <laughs> because we, we are very careful about, and, and all of you as students are, are in this moment where you're trying to build your resume and you're trying to figure out how can I look good for the next job mm -hmm. that I apply for. And so what we do is pick and choose those things that will make us appear to be strong, successful, um, and those are the things we include in the resume. Unfortunately, what we leave out mm -hmm. are all the times it didn't work. <laughs> we went to the legislature, failed, came back home on the plane by ourselves, and, and tried to imagine, now what? How will mm -hmm. we face the What's next the two years going forward without the revenue mm -hmm. that we were supposed to get? Right or the time we fought with a legislator mm -hmm. and uh, he couldn't even look us in the eye, kind of <laughs> looked past me because he was signaling, you don't count, it doesn't matter right. to us what you need, uh, where you are. Uh, or the time you try to pass a bond election, I understand you all have been involved in some of that successfully. The times it works, it's great success. The times it doesn't, you whisper the loss and cry a little bit on, mm -hmm. on Sunday morning after it's right. over. And so many of us will, will have those, or when you apply for a job and didn't get it. Those, those are hard because you put yourself out there. You, you have an interview. You, you know you could do the work mm -hmm. and for some reason don't get the position. So I, it, that would take too many years <laughs> to tell you about. <laughs> but but I, I will tell you one thing that's not on there that there are so many little things that are the real successes. Uh, but I want to tell you about chess because people have predispositions about who you are by what you look like, where you're from, how you speak. And so you're constantly trying to, to create um, an impression when you're with someone. And anyway, and in our community, sometimes you hear in the news the, the invasion at the border. That's right now the, the, the terms being used. Well, no, the border is not being invaded. I'm here, fine, I don't carry a gun, and I, I'm, I'm very fortunate mm -hmm. to that, but I do play chess. And the reason I tell you that story is because I join thousands of children in our neighborhood that are among the best chess players in the United States of America. And it started out in a, in a, high, in a mm -hmm. elementary school classroom 
where a young man is a teacher in elementary school the only male teacher mm -hmm. in the school right. was given the troubling kids you know the mm -hmm. kids that were whatever a little wild or too noisy they were eight years old right. you know? and uh, the principal said here you take him JJ and so he said well what am I supposed to do with him and, he, and mm -hmm. she said I don't know but you're the only man here and, I, I, and I'm not gonna give it to any of the ladies so with that he ended up with the, the boys the, the troubled boys in his class he had taught his own son chess and so he thought well it worked to kind of quiet him down and teach him something so I'm gonna try it with these boys pretty soon his he was bragging in the teachers lounge about how good his boys were in chess so unbeknownst to him the principal decided to um, com to set him up for a match with a gifted schools chess team and she said you're on for a match in a couple of weeks he goes there I'm just I was just bragging in the teachers lounge I don't know if they're really that good or not and so he she said too bad you're on we're, the match is on you better represent as well takes his boys to the match mm -hmm. and of course his boys win. win so from there then other teachers wanted to learn how he had taught mm -hmm. their boys um, chess so he became a teacher of teachers okay. that wanted to teach kids right. how to start chess uh, pretty soon he was teaching teachers throughout the city and the community mm -hmm. and there was an infection there was an invasion but it was of chess kids <laughs> Nerd chat, and they were all well, they're nerds. They were football players too, soccer players. <laughs> but they were, but they were learning. And they started at when they were learning English for a second language. In some cases, they were learning chess, chess concurrently. Right. So chess became their third language: English, Sp or Spanish English, and then chess. So pretty soon, Brownsville became known as a chess powerhouse, right? And then it was playing chess in the state of Texas. Well. This is a long answer, but mm -hmm. it's a good yeah, story. It's a great, it's a so, fantastic story. You, so, so if you win in Texas, mm -hmm. you can, you're halfway to Washington, D.C., right? right? So we had to play Dallas, and Dallas is a big mm -hmm. chess powerhouse. So the kids were taken. They, took up, they had uh, car washes to raise money. School district didn't have money set out for them to, to mm -hmm. go to games. They did for football, but not oh, for chess. chess. And so parents raised money, sent the kids, first time on a... Well, plane, on a plane right. to go to Dallas they didn't have the little blazers on they had on t-shirts because one of the local vendors mm -hmm. had some extra shirts and he said here here's some green t-shirts that'll fit the kids so they were called the green, green shirts, shirts from Brownsville so they go to Dallas and they win the tournament of thousands of kids from throughout oh. the state of Texas and we're talking now yeah. uh, second graders Wow. Yeah, so they win the, the contest on the way back from Dallas everybody's surprised and the coaches start to say I wonder if we should take them to nationals they decide to take them to nationals now they're going to DC more money is raised more car washes cookie sales they get to Washington DC no blazers still still the green shirts and they come in they miss winning the national chess tournament by half a point oh my but that's okay they're at the national chess tournament <laughs> they're in high water and and they are confident mm -hmm. and they are serious minded and you and I know that mm -hmm. if a kid can learn how to play and win mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in chess they can become an engineer a lawyer right. a teacher anything that's for them because that that's right. the confidence is built right. so we started a chess team of course at mm -hmm. UT Brownsville right. we beat UT Dallas much to <laughs> Dallas's you know uh, and then of course we became we are now the new, the new university's chess team UTRGB's chess team is number one in the nation having beat our friends at Harvard and Yale and Princeton to get to the national so when you think of the, the four the final four it's not in basketball it's in <laughs> it's chess, in chess. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you that story because when you see a gymnasium mm -hmm. full of rows and rows of tables and full of kids at all ages playing chess yeah. you're you know you're part of sustaining the democracy right. of the nation mm -hmm. so that's a story that doesn't get on there right. but I'm very very proud to, to, to give you that view of next time you think of Brownsville or next time you yeah. think of the border and what's mm -hmm. going on there what you have is very valuable human capital 
right. that wants very hard to work hard. They get there early before school yep. to take chess. They play chess. They roll out their little uh, boards during lunch. They play chess after school. These are kids that just want an opportunity, not to be given anything, but an right. except opportunity right. to learn. So, so that's why I, I think the chess story. We did it. the same thing in physics, by the way. Gravitational wave astronomy became what we uh, uh, focused on for a few years. Yeah. We helped recruit uh, SpaceX. I love it. SpaceX is now 25 miles from us on Boca Chica, and it was our chess, I mean, our physics students, nerds talking to nerds <laughs> from, from uh, SpaceX, and I say lovingly, nerds, yeah, and right. they're not just nerds, they were super nerds. They're super nerds. <laughs> I mean, they left me in the, in the background. I, could, I know enough physics to sell. Mm -hmm. Physics could get money, but but not president. enough mm -hmm. to go to you know. Right. But so my point is, the human capital yeah. is the most important thing that we have as an as an institution. Absolutely. We built beautiful buildings too. Right. We planted trees, but we we did built more. Yes. Than I that. love it. I love that answer. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, in your time as president, you you have this bold vision, and I really want to dig into that because we're bold. You know, we, we know what we're doing. Um, and I'm taking notes, by the way, everybody in, in our community on how we're doing this. You had a bold vision for what your college could be. How did you move it to, to a university that was bold? And I'm sure there were plenty of people who thought, we can't do that, we don't know how to do it, whatever the language would be. How did you even imagine that that was possible? A, do it. And what happened when it, 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 there was a setback or something that always happens in long processes, right? How did you, as president, keep moving forward boldly in the future? Well, it's never your vision alone. Mm -hmm. People attribute it mm -hmm. often to you, but, right. but it is that that surfaces from like people mm -hmm. all wanting to work in right. a noble work. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to have women and men mm -hmm. um, that wanted to push hard and right. wanted and, and, and gave, had faith mm -hmm. that I was the one to help make that That's happen. Right. Mm -hmm. Not every day, right. <laughs> there were many days that were rough. I mean, I've been sued by the Department of Homeland Security. That's not a good thing to be sued by. I mean, we produced many of the criminal justice majors that are now working for the Department right. of and Homeland Security. Security. And yeah. they would see me say, hi, ma'am, you know, so, <laughs> don't arrest me. <laughs> but they wanted to build a fence on our campus. I understood. Not, yeah. did not happen. But I spent a, a year in fighting. federal court right. fighting Department of Homeland. So not every day mm -hmm. does it work. That's right. not on the resume. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly, either. right? Yeah. But when I go to DC for a meeting, I, I'm always wondering, if they're looking me up and they're going to, that, that'll ever pop up. It hasn't so it hasn't. far. But, but um, I've worked for seven different chancellors mm -hmm. at the University of Texas system. That's seven different bosses. And I've worked for many board members mm -hmm. of Board of Regents, um, the governor appointed, right. local board members appointed by, uh, elected. So I've had many bosses. Mm -hmm. I've had brilliant faculty right. uh, that that allowed me to use their skills in mm -hmm. physics or chess right. um, to help build uh, an institution. So, so how do you decide what the vision is going mm -hmm. to be? That's too long a story, except the short version mm -hmm. is when you get it, mm -hmm. you know you're you got it. it. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's not raise a little bit more money. It's <laughs> not build a new building. Right. It's not buy just that piece of land over there because it's going to fit perfect. It's all of that. It's all that, right. But, but it's it's, it's that big leap. Mm -hmm. uh, George Kosmetsky used to be at our business school, and he said, it's, you leapfrog, Juliet. He said, you don't, have the, the, right. um, uh, you don't have the time to go down the traditional right. path. You've got to leapfrog over others in order to get this community yeah. where it needs to be. Right. And I'll never forget that, because every time I would try to take a ne next step, I thought, does it meet the leapfrog yeah. criteria? <laughs> right. Right? I like Is that. this really yeah. something that, that, I, down. Yeah, that, that moves very <laughs> over others and not in the traditional way? So once you realize you're not a traditional place, it would right. have taken me a century right. to catch up, not even to catch up, just to be in the same race. Right. Remember, because I'm in the UT system, right. and so that's, that's high cotton to be competing in. Right. So I had to figure out ways to 
catapult us mm -hmm. forward. Uh, I remember coming home to tell my husband, we're going to start a university. <laughs> And he said, what's for dinner? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But right. we're going to start with university. Right, exactly. He goes, OK, OK, let's have dinner first. <laughs> so you, you live in the real world. I have right. two children. I have five brilliant grandchildren. Right. So you live in the world, you know, parallel universes all the time. And I'm married to a Mexicano. You, those of you in the audience know what that means. But my Mexicano is the kind that says, you can do this. And when I'd be hesitant about mm -hmm. you know, applying for something or doing something, he'd say, you see that fellow over there? And I'd say, yes. And he goes, what does he have that you don't have? What has he done that you haven't done? Is there anything? And I'd say, well, no. And he'd say, then? Mm -hmm. So, so I, had a, I had support right. from family, mm -hmm. from men and women mm -hmm. who said, I have faith in you. Right. That I'm sure that they often wondered, I hope it's well placed, but, <laughs> but I had lots of people who sure. um, lent me their courage yeah. before I grew my own, because mm -hmm. you don't have it always. You want to have it, but it's hard sometimes when you're in your battles, and mm -hmm. there are many battles, and there are many Goliaths, and you're still the David in the story. And so courage doesn't just come, it's grown, I think, over time. And so I would say that I borrowed it from one of our mm -hmm. trustees who was as courageous a woman as I've ever known. Right. And, and I'd say, what would Mary do? What would Mary do? And when I realized she'd just keep going, mm -hmm. then I had no choice but to make the Let's same decision. Going. So you learn it right. from those around mm -hmm. you, you borrow it, mm -hmm. and you help build it uh, in others. And uh, hope it works at the end awesome. of the day. Great. Does that feel familiar to all of you? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Tell me the $5 story. Well, uh, we all raise money mm -hmm. in our communities, and, and it's hard work. You know, it, uh, raising votes or raising um, is, is difficult when you run for office. Mm -hmm. Trying to get money from very needy people, mm -hmm. from wealthy right. people, it's hard, it's hard too, it's hard, right. but it's a different strategy. From very poor people, it's really tough. Right. And um, we had an occasion to, we had applied for a challenge grant with the Department of Education. Okay. Mm -hmm. Challenge grants allowed you to, to raise money and challenge with a good idea. The government then would match or mm -hmm. double the money you had raised. So we challenged for a million dollars. If we could raise a million dollars in 18 months, this was a long time ago. Right. And so a million dollars, was right. even more it was than it feels money, like right. today. Um, if you could raise a million dollars in 18 months, why 18 months, who knows, but that was the government reg. If you could do it, you would get matched, not with an additional million, mm -hmm. but with additional two million. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know anywhere I could get a two for one return right. on an right. investment. Right. So right. we said, okay, so what's the idea that we're going to propose yeah. for the use of this money? So the idea was you were going to give students, starting out in eighth grade in our community, um, money if they took the college prep curriculum yeah. and if they made A's and B's in those courses. This is the days before recommended curriculum mm -hmm. in high schools and kids yeah. didn't know what they were taking, if it was yeah. business math or, or grocery store math mm -hmm. or a pre-algebra. Right. Right. So we said, we're going to tell you define college prep curriculum and if you're in eighth or ninth grade in any of the schools in our district, you will earn scholarship dollars good for tuition at our school. Great. So they would do the prep work for a few years to get mm -hmm. prepared to come. Right. And then we would scholarship them. So they weren't, at, they weren't working at McDonald's, they were working on getting those A's right. and B's. So if we did that, then we would, we would raise, we would give them scholarship dollars good for tuition mm -hmm. and fees right. at Texas Southmost College. Um, we said that uh, if, they, if they did that really well, we would take the corpus of those dollars. So it was a $3 million corpus, put it in the bank, and spend only half of the interest that it generated. The other half of the interest it generated would go back in to grow the corpus. Mm -hmm. So it would be, an, uh, uh, in that way, in doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, good idea, we got the challenge. So now we just had to raise the million raise dollars. Raise the money. <laughs> so here we are now, okay, good idea. Got the government to say we're in. Now, how do we raise money? We didn't even have a development office when we started, because community colleges in Texas did not right. generally raise a lot of money. So anyway, we hired someone, 
and we started to hustle we started mm -hmm. to work hard and so the usual things happened people did the car washes and did the even had someone who was a a bingo aficionado I well it. I didn't know there was such a thing right but but they go to bingo and play and they would follow the to see where the winners were with a little bowl and they would say would you give to the colleges <laughs> the moment they want so we had there's an idea Katie <laughs> everybody raising money for us uh, I went to all the the animal clubs mm -hmm. the elks and the, elks. the the, what are they, the lions and the, you know, all of, all of those clubs and they have auxiliaries, I came to find out. I went to their mm -hmm. uh, clubs. I got money from the Republican women, put their picture in the paper. The Democratic women were calling me up saying, well, we'll give you some money too. So we went to all the usual right. community uh, groups. It helped me learn my community. Yeah, it right. was a wonderful way to, to find out where the lions meet mm -hmm. and where the elks are. And, and so I got to know them in a way that would be very useful for Absolutely. years to come. Right. Uh, but of course, there still wasn't enough money. So right. then I left the south of Texas okay. and went to Dallas. And I went to the foundations over there. Then I went to the ones in Houston. And so I made the rounds and would come home with some bigger checks. Mm -hmm. I'd walk in very confident at my pitch. And they'd look at me like, now, where are you from? <laughs> and what is your name? Impressed that I could speak English, that you could yeah, tell. Yeah. But beyond that, yeah, you like, know, I had no clue. So I had to sell a little bit. And uh, once one foundation came on, then they would call the other foundation yeah, and right. say, Juliet, got to see us coming towards you. Here's what we're <laughs> pledging. And I didn't know how that worked. And so all of a sudden, they're matching each other's pledges. Oh, so it. I was able to raise some money there. But finally, um, it was close to D-Day, mm -hmm. uh, the, the time we had to finish raising the money and we still had not finished raising. Mm -hmm. So somebody came up with the idea of the Jerry Lewis Telethon. Some of you are older remember the Jerry Lewis Telethon. So before we had a million channels on television, there were just two or three, and if Jerry Lewis was on raising money right. for muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it was, then uh, they would, we would all watch and, and had a phone bank and said, we're gonna get on television, we're gonna get some of our graduates to talk about, if I hadn't gone to this school, I would not have become a nurse, or I would not have become an attorney, and have them tell their story. Yeah. And that, so the phones will start ringing. Right, right. So we're all ready in my office and, and other offices there, with a phone ready for someone to call us, and no phones no, no. rang. And so we ate our pizza and went home. Because <laughs> you so could eat, yes, I, I mean, but, but in those days, the reason I mentioned not enough channels, because everybody had to watch this over and over in our community. Right. So with, regardless of what you turned on, you were going to see our plea to give us some money. Eventually, that saturated the market sufficiently to where the phone started to ring. Awesome. And ring and ring. So for the next five days, we actually did raise a quite a bit of money, but we still were short. Okay. And so we're there the last day, and you know who, who media comes around when they know they can sniff a disaster, <laughs> right? They know when something's <laughs> not going to work, and they want to be front line. And, and so we had media in my office that day, and, and my secretary said, that lady that just came in here with a baby wanted to see you, but she didn't like all of the attention, so she's leaving. I think you need to go and see her. So I went out of my office, and in Spanish, I, I met a lady, talked to her, and she, uh, she had a baby in her arms, and she had a baby in a carriage. She had walked from Hortensia Street, which okay. is about 12 um, miles from, oh, wow. I mean, 12 blocks from okay. campus. Mm -hmm. and, and it was hot, and mm -hmm. it was the middle of summer, and Brownsville gets Real hot, hot yeah. and humid. And she had a $5 bill in her pocket and she would stick had pulled the five dollar bill out and she was ironing it lo estaba planchando she was ironing mm -hmm. it because she didn't want to give it to me all scrunched up because it was kind of scrunched up and i saw her with that baby and i saw the baby in the carriage and i realized where she had come from and i had i had lost all concern about raising money i'd take it from anybody i mean i was that <laughs> vicious at this point but I knew that that day, that lady needed that $5 a whole lot more than I did. And so I said, tell me why you're giving me this money. And she said, it's the only hope I have for my children. I took the $5 and she left. And we raced, we made our million dollar 
um, goal. We, uh, that fund today has distributed mm -hmm. over 50,000 uh, scholarships. Uh -huh. It has, it is now worth more than six million dollars because it continues to grow. Right. And it did exactly what we had hoped it would, it would prepare students. But, but it, was, it was much more for me than raising the money. Right. That lady taught mm -hmm. me why we do this right. work. And the why was it was the only hope right. that her children had. My parents did not get to go to college. They, um, even though my mother was in the honors class of her mm -hmm. high school graduating class, it was in depression. There was right. no money to be able to go. My father had come from Monterrey in Mexico. He was a legal resident alien, carried a green card very proudly. He had graduated in the top of his class in high school. It was a depression. There mm -hmm. was no money. And there was no university there for them. For them. Right. And they were not going to see that that happened to their children. Right. So it was my turn at bat, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I needed to do something that would make a difference. But, but sometimes you learn, mm -hmm. not from the college presidents, but from people right. whose heart Absolutely. Um, needs you to succeed. And that's a heavy burden uh, to carry, yeah. but it's worth it. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, so last night, we had an event last night, and, and uh, you told us a little bit about more about your family. Um, if you're comfortable, I would love for them to hear particularly about your mom and how she continues to inspire you every day. Because I think as you've done this work, it's daunting. There are days, as you said, that it's exhausting, it's daunting. You don't always know where you're going to get that next ability to keep on moving. And I know that she is in your heart. So whatever you'd want to say about that, I think they would love to hear it. So I was lucky enough to be uh, born uh, to two wonderful mm -hmm. parents. And, and my father's name was Romeo in Spanish, which translates into Romeo. So my older brother is named Romeo, and I am Juliet. Juliet. So my mother was obviously loved Shakespeare and yeah. corny, and so people at school would say, Romeo, Romeo, where art thou? Uh, and where is Juliet? And he'd say, oh, she's over there in that classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so so we had a, um, we grew up with a, 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 in a, in an environment where mother had read, dad mm -hmm. had read, dad came over from Mexico, as I said, <clears throat> began school in Mexico, so had a perfect command of right. Spanish, and taught us to be very proud of where he had come from, our language, and, and, uh, and how, to, how important it was to maintain both languages mm -hmm. in life. And mother um, had grown up in a town where the Mexican-Americans in the town could only swim in the public swimming pool one day a year. And the next day, they drained the pool. So the messages were really clear in her mm -hmm. town. Mm -hmm. She lived on the wrong side of the tracks, literally. There was a railroad track. And mother lived on B Street. The, the streets on that side of the track were named uh, A, B, C, D. Uh, the names of the streets on the Anglo part of the town were named after the presidents of the United States, mm -hmm. Jackson, Van Buren. So she had grown up mm -hmm. in, a, in a place that did not receive her mm -hmm. into school. She ended, ended up, my, there was a wonderful story in the family, and I, I will tell it mm -hmm. carefully, but my grandfather apparently got tired of the fact that the kids were going, his children were going to an inferior school. So he and his wife decided it's time to take action. So my grandfather was a merchant and had a mercantile store downtown. Mm -hmm. And it still made no difference, even though you know, he was a merchant and well-read, his kids still couldn't go mm -hmm. to the better school. So he had a shotgun. <laughs> and the shotgun was to scare the snakes when he went out with his little wagon in the, on the weekend to sell his goods on the ranchitos. And, but he decided to take his shotgun to the superintendent's mm -hmm. office one day with the three children that were ready to go to school and could not get into these schools. And so the story in the family gets better with every retelling you can imagine. <laughs> but the story is that he took his shotgun, very peaceful man, 
and he simply put it down on the desk of the superintendent. Of course, the superintendent's looking down <laughs> a little bit. And he says, my children need to be enrolled in, in this school. And he says, I'm sorry, Mr. Lozano, there's not enough room for them. And he said, my children need to be enrolled in your school. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, I, I will enroll them, no problem, except that there's not enough desks. I will make the desks mm -hmm. for you, but my children will be enrolled. Before he left, the children were enrolled in that school. So my mother had grown up in a, in a, yeah. in a moment of, of advocacy. She learned right. it from a very young age. Um, but when she got to be uh, in high school in her honors classes, um, it was time for the final uh, awards, and she did not become valedictorian. She was salutictorian, mm -hmm. having missed it by a fraction of a point. And the story was that there was no way a Mexican girl was going to be valedictorian in that town. So you would have thought my mother would have been bitter or, or angry. My father was angry, <laughs> but my mother was just, you know, sweetheart, that's the mm -hmm. world, it, unfortunately, that we live in. So you need to be smarter mm -hmm. than the other kids. You need to do it in two languages. And no heads bowed. Just move forward, do the right thing, help those around you. So we had the benefit of, of smart parents who, while they, they themselves had not gone to right. college, insisted that we were going to right. go ourselves. Right. So I felt that it was important then in our community to make that change. But, but mother died very young. She mm -hmm. was 40 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, it was, of course, very difficult. She had cancer. MD Anderson was just opening in yeah, Houston. Right. It was a, a baby hospital. And, um, and so my father raised my two brothers and I. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the most important things my father did, aside from surviving it all, was to sit us down one day. And he, my brothers and I, I was nine my older brother was 11, my younger brother was five. Mm -hmm. And he said, did you all go to school today and were you well fed? And he said, right. yeah, dad, we're okay. And uh, did you have a nice place to sleep last night? Yes, dad, the house is fine. We had a small house, one bathroom, mm -hmm. very comfortable though. And, and we thought, dad's lost it. What's wrong with dad? You know, why is he asking us these questions? And um, he said, you all have survived mm -hmm. the worst, worst thing. thing that could ever happen to you in your lives. Right. You have lost your mother and you have survived it. Nothing that ever happens to you again mm -hmm. is going to be harder than what you all have done. Right. You're strong, you're resilient, mm -hmm. you will make it. And I remember at the time still not getting it until I got older and, and then the words came back. Every time mm -hmm. I get hit in a way or I didn't get to do what I wanted to, I think, yeah, but we're strong, we're resilient. Right. You know, he, he gave us the gift of not feeling abused in any way because, or unlucky, but in fact being strengthened mm -hmm. by, by that having answer. survived that moment. We need right. to gift that to our kids. Mm -hmm. We need to tell them it's, 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 of course you're going to have tough times, but mm -hmm. you're also going to be gifted with that resilience mm -hmm. that comes from that right. to overcome the next thing. So there have been moments in my life, is what I was saying last mm -hmm. night, where I'm spent, you know, we've mm -hmm. lost the yep. effort, we didn't get this happen, I didn't get the physics guy I wanted, you know, I had an argument with a chancellor, uh, whatever it was. <laughs> that never happened. And I'd come, you know, and I'd try to figure out, I'm done, I'm just done, maybe it's time for me to be gone. And then I'd get this energy, yeah. and it wasn't from me. And I don't know how else to explain it, but, but it would just kind of re-energize the spirit. And it was like, are you kidding? You're not done? You're, you know, this is important right, work, right, right. and it's not about you. You right. happen to be in the in chair this at this moment. There are a lot of people counting on you right. doing it right. So I think that with my mother's strength mm -hmm. and energy, we've done the work together. I love it. I love it, thank you. Mm. So I think we have time for one or two audience questions, if anyone has one. And Brittany has the, the roaming mic, and so I think we have one. I have lots of questions. I can keep going. <laughs> oh, good. Don, Don has a question. I want to know if you're from Texas, would you stand? Woo! <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Texas, from Texas. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm from the valley. Uh, from the valley? I'm from the valley. That counts. <laughs> so this is this is your people These are from your Texas. People. And so my question to you is, are you coming back? Am I what? Are you coming back? Are you oh. coming back? <laughs> when are you going to come back? When are you? Well, now I know my way. That's the thing. <laughs> At first, it was like, how do you get there from here? Um, I'll be back, Don. I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. By the way, I've, I've met gracious, gracious people, kind, kind folks. Um, made some new friends, new colleagues, and I thank you very much for sharing uh, that with me and for inviting me into your home. I sincerely appreciate it. We have a question right over here up front and center. Hello, my name is Marik Sandra Alvarez, and my question to you is, did you have a mentor, and how important is mentorship for you? I had many, and it's a very good question. I had my mother, my father. Mm -hmm. My father became a feminist as I grew older and ran into buzz saws. You know, he said, Esos desgraciados no saben lo que tienen. You know, he would say, Those guys don't know what they're doing, they're, who they're dealing with. And they'll, they'll, you know, and my father taught me because mother had died, my father would debrief with me after a rough day at work, mm -hmm. right? And so he would tell me about what was going on, and he worked in. Uh, for an airlines, and so he was always doing work between the two countries, and he was a broker for them, and so he, he had to deal with people from both sides of the border with different rules that governed how they did business, and so I would just listen to be polite, but I was learning a great deal. So, so lots of mentorship came from both of my parents. And then I was so fortunate to have people along the way who decided that I had enough um, to, to help them build, you know, the clay was there for them to mold me into something better, smarter, uh, more business-like. And so I had women who decided to help me, introduce me to other folks. I have a, ba a local banker who took me to a foundation in, in, uh, in Houston. And you can tell I can speak without breathing. And so I'm making the pitch to the foundation and the bankers sitting next to me. And I guess I had gone on too long. And so the banker says, she's trying to ask you for $2.4 million. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him, and he, and he said, done. She got it. <laughs> so, so, you know, Take note. people teach you what you don't know. They strengthen you by, you know, they, he, I had to learn how to be more direct. Here's what I need. Here's why I need it. Here's what we'll do with it. And, and I had to get the courage up to do that. He taught me that. So I learned from every board that I ever served on. I knew sometimes, by the way, I was getting invited because I was female. Mm -hmm. I knew I was getting invited because I was Hispanic and female, a twofer, right? Mm -hmm. I knew that. Yeah. I mean, you're not fooled by, by invitations like that. But I took it on as an mm -hmm. opportunity to represent both females and, and, uh, and Latinos, but also a place to learn. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from sitting next to a guy, I'll say a guy, and say, tell me how you came to be a banker. Oh my gosh, for the next hour, right? I heard everything that I needed to know about to the pathways uh -huh. that I, or on a plane, I would ask someone. Um, so constant state of learning, mm -hmm. uh, aside from the, and taking the jobs that no one else wants. Sometimes you have to take that real crummy job, you don't know why, but to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And all those connections in the long term, pay off. Not clearly when you're doing a terrible job, but because you're going to manage people like that or you're going to lead them and you need to know what they're suffering, what they're going through. So have I had mentors? Oh my goodness. I've had parents. Uh, I haven't had aunts. Uh, we have a strong family and primas, uh, cousins, and uh, we call each other up. We network with each other and somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. So you don't do this work by yourself. You cannot be successful. You need that uh, mentorship in faculty and, and donors, uh, in politicians on both sides of the aisle, especially if you live in Texas. Mm -hmm. And so it's real. It's a real world that you must maneuver. 
and you can't pick and choose who you're going to deal with sometimes. So your, your mission and your vision has to mm -hmm. be stronger than whatever prejudice you might have or predisposition and just cut through because a lot of people depend on you succeeding. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Brittany, you're telling me there's one? One more. Oh, um, okay. Um, I'm from Corpus Christi, or as we say, Corpus. Corpus. And, uh, and uh, so I've loved hearing all about this. I'm really homesick now. So um, everything that you said, there are a lot of students who are here and some, some other people who are here but who are students too, still trying to learn what this life is all about. What would be the one thing that you would say to all of us uh, here we are in 2024, that we need to know about what you've learned in your life and what we need to know with reference to the future, especially, as you said, to our precious United States. Thank you. Um, I had cousins in Corpus, and the, it was interesting to, to know them because they grew up three hours from the border, and, but we were very different. The further you move in, to the United States, mm -hmm. different kind of Spanish you, you use in family. And, and mm -hmm. so even though it was just a, a ways, it was on the other side of the King Ranch. So that says a lot for us in Texas. Um, I guess the one thing is to do important work. If I, you know, if I, if someone offered me a job to borrow uh, and the salary was good and place where I could work was good, people were good, I want to know if it's worth my time. And I don't mean that in a personal, arrogant way. But, you know, we've been blessed to be here. Someone has said, you got a few more years, lady. And so you want to know, so why and what am I supposed to do? Right. What is important work? And that can happen when you're 20 or 30 or 70. Doesn't matter. But you've been given a gift of time and some talents. And mother was a big mm -hmm. one on, you've been given gifts. You know, mm -hmm. you can talk, you can, you're smart, for some reason, to do common good, to do work for others, not only for yourself. So find work that respirates the soul. And, and then be about gathering good people to your side. Because the, the bigger work you choose, the more people you need to do it with. It's not solo work. Uh, you want to join a community of folks that are, that are aimed in the same direction. And that's powerful. Because you'll have bad days, and you'll need mm -hmm. them to lift you during those times. And then you'll have to do the same with someone else. So, so I would say that when you look back, I, I don't, do I have any regrets? Oh, I never ironed a shirt for my husband <laughs> when we were in college. That's he not wore, a regret, though. <laughs> you know, knit shirts a lot. And, and now he gets them ironed, but, <laughs> but he didn't then. I wasn't at my children's events always, but, but I was there as much as I could. They survived it. Uh, I now am trying to be there for grandkids also. So, you know, do the work, because your time is precious. Time away from your family, time away from your, your other duties and responsibilities. Do work that matters, right. and do it in a way that matters. Right. Let's thank her one more time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Garcia, to you and your daughter, Paulita, we're so grateful for the two of you to come to Kansas, to come to our community. We're so grateful that we were able to host you. Thank you. Thank you for your service and dedication in higher education. Clearly, it is where you're meant to be. And I am so grateful that you've joined us today. Thank you for the example you provide to us. Mission is so important, and very clearly, it's in your heart. Today was a great honor for me and for our college. I want to express my sincere gratitude to our partners who made this day possible. The Docking family, which is right here in front. <laughs>
and my daughter, Paulita. And Paulita, yes. <laughs> it's been a joy to watch the two of you with each other. It's incredibly sweet and loving, so thank you. And thank you to all of you who are here in the room with us, those of you watching us on, uh, through the streaming, thank you. It's been a great opportunity today for us to learn from Dr. Garcia and be with her for a brief moment. With gratitude, I wish all of you a wonderful rest of a day. Be builders, be bold, with service in your heart. Thank you.